Velia Papan kept talking, weeping, retching. Suddenly, the blind old woman in her rickrack dressing gown and with her thin gray hair plaited into a rat's tail, stepped forward and pushed Velia Papan with all her strength. He stumbled backwards down the kitchen steps and lay sprawled in the wet mud. He was taken completely by surprise. Part of the taboo of being an untouchable was expecting not to be touched. Baby Kochima, walking past the kitchen, heard the commotion. She found Mamachi spitting into the rain. Thu! 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 And Velia Papin lying in the slush, wet, weeping, groveling, offering to kill his son, to tear him limb from limb. Mamachi was shouting, Drunken dog! Drunken paravan liar! Over the din, Kochumaria shouted Velia Papin's story to baby Kochuma. Baby Kochuma recognized at once the immense potential of the situation, but immediately anointed her thoughts with unctuous oils. She bloomed. She saw it as God's way of punishing Amu for her sins and simultaneously avenging her, baby Kochuma's, humiliation at the hands of Veluta and the men in the march, the Modulali Maria Kuti taunts, the forced flag waving. She set sail at once, a ship of goodness plowing through a sea of sin. Baby Kochima put her heavy arm around Mamachi. It must be true, she said in a quiet voice. She's quite capable of it, and so is he. Velia Papin would not lie about something like this. She made Velia Papin repeat his story, stopping him every now and then for details. Whose boat? How often? How long had it been going on? When Velia Papin finished, Baby Kochima turned to Mamachi. He must go, she said, tonight, before it goes any farther, before we are completely ruined. Then she shuddered her schoolgirl shudder. That was when she said, How could she stand the smell? Haven't you noticed? They have a particular smell, these paravans. With that olfactory observation, that specific little detail, the terror unspooled. Mamachi's rage at the old one-eyed paravan, standing in the rain, drunk, dribbling, and covered in mud, was redirected into a cold contempt for her daughter and what she had done. Mamachi thought and nearly vomited, like a dog with a bitch on heat. Her tolerance of men's needs, as far as her son was concerned, became the fuel for her unmanageable fury at her daughter. She had defiled generations of breeding, the little blessed one, blessed personally by the patriarch of Antioch, an imperial entomologist, a Rhodes scholar from Oxford, and brought the family to its knees. For generations to come, forever now, people would point at them at weddings and funerals, at baptisms and birthday parties. They'd nudge and whisper, it was all finished now. Mamachi lost control. They did what they had to do, the two old ladies. Mamachi provided the passion, baby Kochima the plan. Kochumaria was their midget lieutenant. They locked Amu up, tricked her into her bedroom before they sent for Veluta. They knew that they had to get him to leave a Yemenem before Chaco returned. They could neither trust nor predict what Chaco's attitude would be. It wasn't entirely their fault, though, that the whole thing spun out of control like a deranged top that it lashed out at those that crossed its path, that by the time Chaco and Margaret Kochima returned from Cochin, it was too late. The fisherman had already found Sophie Mall. Picture him. Out in his boat at dawn, at the mouth of the river he has known all his life. It is still quick and swollen from the previous night's rain. Something bobs past in the water, and the colors catch his eye. Mauve, red-brown, beach sand, it moves with the current, swiftly towards the sea. He sends out his bamboo pole to stop it and draw it towards him. It's a wrinkled mermaid, a merchild, a mere merchild, with red-brown hair, with an imperial entomologist's nose, and a silver thimble clenched for luck in her fist. He pulls her out of the water into his boat. He puts his thin cotton towel under her. She lies at the bottom of his boat, with his silver haul of small fish. He rose home. Die, die, die.
stuck a tie tie dum, thinking how wrong it is for a fisherman to believe that he knows his river well. No one knows what it may snatch or suddenly yield, or when. That is what makes fishermen pray. At the Kotayam police station, a shaking baby Kochima was ushered into the station house officer's room. She told Inspector Thomas Matthew of the circumstances that had led her to the sudden dismissal of a factory worker, a paravan. A few days ago he had tried to... to... to force himself on her niece, she said. A divorcee with two children. Baby Kochima misrepresented the relationship between Amu and Veluta, not for Amu's sake, but to contain the scandal and salvage the family's reputation in Inspector Thomas Matthews' eyes. As baby Kochima told her story, she began to believe it. Why wasn't the matter reported to the police in the first place, the inspector wanted to know. We are an old family, baby Kochima said. These are not things we want talked about. Inspector Thomas Matthew, receding behind his bustling Air Indian moustache, understood perfectly. He had a touchable wife, two touchable daughters, whole touchable generations waiting in their touchable wombs. Where is the molestie now? At home? She doesn't know I've come here. She wouldn't have let me come. Naturally, she's frantic with worry about the children. Hysterical. Later, when the real story reached Inspector Thomas Matthew, the fact that what the paravan had taken from the touchable kingdom had not been snatched, but given, concerned him deeply. So after Sophie Mall's funeral, when Amu went to him with the twins to tell him that a mistake had been made, and he tapped her breast with his baton, it was not a policeman's spontaneous brutishness on his part. He knew exactly what he was doing. It was a premeditated gesture, calculated to humiliate and terrorize her, an attempt to instill order into a world gone wrong. Still later, when the dust had settled and he had had the paperwork organized, Inspector Thomas Matthew congratulated himself for the way it had all turned out. But now he listened carefully and courteously as baby Kochima constructed her story. Last night it was getting dark, around seven in the evening, when he came to the house to threaten us. He knew that the man of the house, my nephew Chaco Ipe, was, is, away in Cochin. We were three women alone in the house. We told him that if he did not leave a Yemenem quietly, we would call the police. He started off by saying that my niece had consented. Can you imagine? He asked us what proof we had of what we were accusing him of. He said that according to the labor laws, we had no grounds on which to dismiss him. He was very calm. The days are gone, he told us, when you can kick us around like dogs. By now, baby Kochima sounded utterly convincing. Then her imagination took over completely. She didn't describe how Mamachi had lost control, how she had gone up to Veluta and spat right into his face, the things she had said to him, the name she had called him. Instead, she described to Inspector Thomas Matthew how it was not just what Veluta had said that had made her come to the police, but the way he said it. His complete lack of remorse, which was what had shocked her most, without realizing it herself, she grafted the manner of the man who had humiliated her during the march onto Veluta. She had known the paravan since he was a child, baby Kochima said. He had been educated by her family in the untouchable school started by her father, Punyan Kunyu. She mentioned seeing him in the march on the way to Cochin and the rumors that he was, or had been, a Naxalite. She didn't notice the faint furrow of worry that this piece of information produced on the inspector's brow. She had warned her nephew about him, baby Kochima said, but never in her wildest dreams had she thought that it would ever come to this. A beautiful child was dead. Two children were missing. Baby Kochima broke down. Inspector Thomas Matthew gave her a cup of police tea. When she was feeling a little better, he helped her to set down all she had told him in her first information report. The rascal would be caught before the day was out, he said. A paravan with a pair of two egg twins, hounded by history. He knew there weren't many places for him to hide. Inspector Thomas Matthew was a prudent man. He took one precaution. 
he sent a jeep to fetch comrade K.N.M. Pilla to the police station. It was crucial for him to know whether the Paravan had any political support or whether he was operating alone. When Comrade Pilla arrived, he was ushered into the seat that Baby Kochima had only recently vacated. Inspector Thomas Matthew showed him Baby Kochima's first information report. The two men had a conversation, brief, cryptic, to the point. They were not friends, Comrade Pilla and Inspector Thomas Matthew, and they didn't trust each other, but they understood each other perfectly. Comrade Pilla told Inspector Thomas Matthew that he was acquainted with Veluta, but omitted to mention that Veluta was a member of the Communist Party, or that Veluta had knocked on his door late the previous night, which made Comrade Pilla the last person to have seen Veluta before he disappeared. Nor, though he knew it to be untrue, did Comrade Pilla refute the allegation of attempted rape in Baby Kochima's first information report. He merely assured Inspector Thomas Matthew that as far as he was concerned, Veluta did not have the patronage or the protection of the Communist Party, that he was on his own. After Comrade Pilla left, Inspector Thomas Matthew went over their conversation in his mind, teasing it, testing its logic, looking for loopholes. When he was satisfied, he instructed his men. Meanwhile, baby Kochima returned to Ayemenem. The Plymouth was parked in the driveway. Margaret Kochima and Chako were back from Cochin. Sophie Mall was laid out on the Shay Long. When Margaret Kochima saw her little daughter's body, shock swelled in her like phantom applause in an empty auditorium. She had come to Ayemenem to heal her wounded world and had lost all of it instead. She shattered like glass. Her memories of the days that followed were fuzzy, long, dim hours of thick, furry tongue serenity, medically administered by Dr. Verghese Verghese, lacerated by sharp, steely slashes of hysteria, as keen and cutting as the edge of a new razor blade. She remembered faintly the funeral in the yellow church, the sad singing, a bat that had bothered someone. She remembered the sounds of doors being battered down and frightened women's voices. She never forgot her rational rage at the two younger children who had for some reason been spared. Her fevered mind fastened like a limpet onto the notion that Esther was somehow responsible for Sophie Moll's death. Odd, considering that Margaret Kochma didn't know that it was Esther stirring wizard with a puff who had rode jam and thought two thoughts, Esther who had broken rules and rode Sophie Moll and Rahel across the river in the afternoons in a little boat. Esther, who had abrogated a sickle smell by waving a Marxist flag at it. Esther, who had made the back veranda of the history house their home away from home, furnished with a grass mat and most of their toys, a catapult, an inflatable goose, a Qantas koala with loosened button eyes. And finally, on that dreadful night, Esther, who had decided that though it was dark and raining, the time had come for them to run away, because Amu didn't want them any more. Despite not knowing any of this, why did Margaret Kochima blame Esther for what happened to Sophie? Perhaps she had a mother's instinct. Strangely, the person that Margaret Kochima never thought about was Veluta. Of him, she had no memory at all, not even what he looked like. Perhaps this was because she never really knew him, nor ever heard what happened to him. The God of Loss, the God of Small Things. He left no footprints in sand, no ripples in water, no image in mirrors. After all, Margaret Kochima wasn't with the platoon of touchable policemen when they crossed the swollen river. Their wide cocky shorts rigid with starch, the metallic clink of handcuffs in someone's heavy pocket. It is unreasonable to expect a person to remember what she didn't know had happened. Sorrow, however, was still two weeks away on that blue cross-stitch afternoon, as Margaret Kochima lay jet-lagged and still asleep. Chaco, on his way to see Comrade K.N.M. Pilla, drifted past the bedroom window like an anxious, stealthy whale, intending to peep in to see whether his wife, ex-wife Chaco, and daughter were awake and needed anything. At the last minute his courage failed him and he floated fatly by without looking in. Sophie Moll, awake, 
alive, alert, saw him go. Sophie Maul got out of bed and rummaged through her sleeping mother's purse. She found what she was looking for, the keys to the large, locked suitcase on the floor, with its airline stickers and baggage tags. She opened it and rooted through the contents with all the delicacy of a dog digging up a flower bed. Take everything, her colleagues had advised Margaret Kochima in concerned voices. You never know, which was their way of saying to a colleague traveling to the heart of darkness that, A, anything can happen to anyone. So, B, it's best to be prepared. Sophie Mall eventually found what she had been looking for. Presents for her cousins, triangular towers of Toblerone chocolate, soft and slanting in the heat, socks with separate multicolored toes, and two ballpoint pens, the top halves filled with water in which a cut-out collage of a London streetscape was suspended. A red double-decker bus, propelled by an air bubble, floated up and down the silent street. Sophie Mall put the presents into her go-go bag and went forth into the world to drive a hard bargain, to negotiate a friendship. A friendship that, unfortunately, would be left dangling, flailing into the air with no foothold. A friendship that never circled around into a story, which is why, far more quickly than ever should have happened, Sophie Mall became a memory, while the loss of Sophie Mall grew robust and alive. Comrade Pilla wasn't in when Chaco arrived. His wife, Kalyani, with fresh sandalwood paste on her forehead, made him sit down on a steel folding chair in their small front room and disappear through the bright pink nylon lace curtain doorway into a dark adjoining room, where the small flame from a large brass oil lamp flickered. Chaco was too big for the room. The blue walls crowded him. He glanced around, tense and a little uneasy. Comrade Pilla's mother, a minute old lady in a brown blouse and off-white mundu, sat on the edge of the high wooden bed that was pushed against the wall, her feet dangling high above the floor. She stared vacantly at the wall opposite her, rocking herself gently, grunting regular rhythmic little grunts, like a bored passenger on a long bus journey. The rotating table fan by the bed measured out its mechanical breeze in exemplary, democratic turns, first lifting what was left of old Mrs. Pilla's hair, then Chaco's. The mosquitoes dispersed and reassembled tirelessly. Kalyani returned with a stainless steel glass of filter coffee and a stainless steel plate of banana chips for Chaco. He has gone to Alasa. He'll be back any time now, she said. Young Lennon appeared at the door in red stretch lawn shorts. He stood on one thin leg like a stork and twisted the pink lace curtain into a pole, staring at Chaco with his mother's eyes. Mon, go and call Lata, Mrs. Pilla said to him. Lennon remained where he was and still staring at Chaco, screeched effortlessly in the way only children can. Lata! Lata! You're wanted! Our niece from Kotayam, his elder brother's daughter, Mrs. Pilla explained. She won the first prize for elocution at the youth festival in Trivandrum last week. A combative-looking young girl of about twelve or thirteen appeared through the lace curtain. Do you know who this is? Mrs. Pilla asked Lata. Lata shook her head. Chakosar, our factory modalali. He studied in London, Oxford, Mrs. Pilla said. Will you do your recitation for him? Lata complied without hesitation. She planted her feet slightly apart. Respected chairman, she bowed to Chako. My dear judges and... She looked around at the imaginary audience crowded into the small hot room. Beloved friends. She paused theatrically. Today I would like to recite to you a poem by Sir Walter Scott entitled Lokinvar. Her gaze was fixed unseeingly just above Chaco's head. She swayed slightly as she spoke. At first Chaco thought it was a Malayalam translation of Lokinvar. The words ran into each other. Like in Malayalam, the last syllable of one word attached itself to the first syllable of the next. It was rendered at remarkable speed. 
Oh, young Lord, his vars come out of the west through a world of wide border. His steed was the best and service good broadsword. His weapon said none. He rode all unarmed and he rode all alone. Comrade Pillar arrived mid-poem. A sheen of sweat glazed his skin. His mundu was folded up over his knees. Dark sweat stains spread under his tyrolean armpits. He had the easy authority of the man of the house. He smiled and nodded a greeting to Chaco, but did not acknowledge the presence of his wife or his mother. Lata's eyes flicked towards him for permission to continue with the poem. It was granted. Comrade Pillow took off his shirt, rolled it into a ball, and wiped his armpits with it. When he finished, Kalyani took it from him and held it as though it was a gift, a bouquet of flowers. When Lata finished, Chaco applauded with genuine kindness. She did not acknowledge his applause with even a flicker of a smile. She was like an East German swimmer at a local competition. Her eyes were firmly fixed on Olympic gold. Any lesser achievement she took as her due. Comrade Pilla beckoned to her and whispered in her ear, Go and tell Potachen and Matukuti that if they want to see me, they should come immediately. No, comrade. Really, I, I won't have anything more, Chaco said, assuming that Comrade Pilla was sending Lata off for more snacks. Comrade Pilla grateful for the misunderstanding, perpetuated it. No, no, no. Ha! What is this? Edi Kalyani, bring a plate of those Avalos Undas. As an aspiring politician, it was essential for Comrade Pilla to be seen in his chosen constituency as a man of influence. He wanted to use Chaco's visit to impress local supplicants and party workers. Potachen and Matakuti, the men he sent for, were villagers who had asked him to use his connections at the Kotayam hospital to secure nursing jobs for their daughters. Comrade Pilla was keen that they be seen waiting outside his house for their appointment with him. The more people that were seen waiting to meet him, the busier he would appear, the better the impression he would make. And if the waiting people saw that the factory Modalali himself had come to see him on his turf, he knew it would give off all sorts of useful signals. With a street fighter's unerring instincts, Comrade Pilla knew that his straightened circumstances, his small, hot house, his grunting mother, his obvious proximity to the toiling masses, gave him a power over Chaco that in those revolutionary times no amount of Oxford education could match. He held his poverty like a gun to Chaco's head. Chaco brought out a crumpled piece of paper on which he had tried to sketch the rough layout for a new label that he wanted Comrade K.N.M. Pilla to print. By the time they finished discussing the label for the vinegar, Chaco and Comrade Pilla had each acquired personal mosquito funnels. They agreed on a delivery date. So, yesterday's march was a success, Chaco said, finally broaching the real reason for his visit. Comrades have presented memorandum to party high command. Now let us see. We only have to wait and watch. We passed them on the road yesterday, Chaco said. The procession. On the way to Cochin, I suppose, Comrade Pilla said. But according to party sources, Trivandrum response was much more better. There were thousands of comrades in Cochin, too, Chaco said. In fact, my niece saw our young Veluta among them. Oh, I see. Comrade Pilla was caught off guard. Yes, he is good worker, he said thoughtfully. Highly intelligent. He is. Chaco said, an excellent carpenter with an engineer's mind. If it wasn't for... Not that worker, comrade, comrade Pilla said. Party worker. Ah, I see. So he's a card holder. Oh, yes, comrade Pilla said softly. Oh, yes. Oru karyam parayati. Comrade Pilla switched to Malayalam and a confiding conspiratorial voice. I'm speaking as a friend, Keto. Off the record. That paravan is going to cause trouble for you, he said. Take it from me. Get him a job somewhere else. Send him off. Chaco was puzzled at the turn the conversation had taken. He had only intended to find out what was happening, where things stood. He had expected to encounter antagonism, even confrontation, and instead was being offered sly, misguided collusion. Send him away? But why? I have no objections to him being a cardholder. I'm sure he's just experimenting, testing his wings, 
He's a sensible fellow, comrade. I trust him. Not like that, comrade Tilov said. He may be very well okay as a person, but other workers are not happy with him. Already they are coming to me with complaints. You see, comrade, from a local standpoint, these caste issues are very deep-rooted. Chaco smiled half-heartedly. You say my workers are coming to you with complaints? Oh, yes, correct, Comrade Pilla said. Anything specific? Nothing specifically as such, Comrade K.N.M. Pilla said. But see, Comrade, any benefits that you give him, naturally, others are resenting it. They see it as a partiality. After all, whatever job he does, carpenter or electrician or whatever it is, for them, he is just a paravan. It is a conditioning they have from birth. This, I myself have told them, is wrong. But frankly speaking, comrade, change is one thing. Acceptance is another. You should be cautious. Better for him, you send him off. My dear fellow, Chaco said, that's impossible. He's invaluable. He practically runs the factory, and we can't solve the problem by sending all the paravans away. Surely we have to learn to deal with this nonsense. Comrade Pilla disliked being addressed as my dear fellow. It spoiled his mood completely. That may be, he said caustically, but Rome was not built in a day. Keep it in mind, comrade, that this is not your Oxford College. For you, what is a nonsense, for masses, it is something different. Lata arrived with Potachen and Matakuti. The men were made to wait outside. The door was left ajar. When Comrade Pilla spoke next, he spoke in Malayalam and made sure it was loud enough for his audience outside. Of course, the proper forum to air workers' grievances is through the union. And in this case, when Moralali himself is a comrade, it is a shameful matter for them not to be unionized and join the party struggle. I've thought of that, Chaco said. I am going to formally organize them into a union. They will elect their own representatives. But comrade... You cannot stage their revolution for them. You can only create awareness. Educate them. They must launch their own struggle. They must overcome their fears. Of whom? Chaco smiled. Me? No, not you, my dear comrade. Of centuries of oppression. Then, comrade Pilla, in a hectoring voice, quoted Chairman Mao in Malayalam, his expression curiously like his niece's. Revolution is not a dinner party. Revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence in which one class overthrows another. And so, having bagged the contract for the synthetic cooking vinegar labels, he deftly banished Chaco from the fighting ranks of the overthrowers to the treacherous ranks of the to-be-overthrown. The small, thin man and the big, fat man. Comic book adversaries in a still-to-come war. It turned out to be a war which, unfortunately for Comrade Pilla, would end almost before it began. Victory was gifted to him, wrapped and beribboned on a silver tray. Only then, when it was too late and Paradise Pickles slumped softly to the floor, without so much as a murmur or even the pretense of resistance, did Comrade Pilla realize that what he really needed was the process of war more than the outcome of victory. War could have been the stallion that he rode, part of, if not all, the way to the legislative assembly, where his victory left him no better off than when he started out. He broke the eggs, but burned the omelette. Nobody ever learned the precise nature of the role that Comrade Pilla played in the events that followed. Even Chaco, who knew that the fervent, high-pitched speeches about rights of untouchables, cast is class, comrades, delivered by Comrade Pilla during the Marxist party siege of Paradise Pickles, was pharisaic. Never learned the whole story. Not that he cared to find out. By then, numbed by the loss of Sophie Moll, he looked out at everything with a vision smudged with grief. Like a child, touched by tragedy, who grows up suddenly and abandons his playthings, Chaco dumped his toys. Pickle Baron dreams and the people's war in his glass-paned cupboard. After Paradise Pickles closed down, some rice fields were sold, 
along with their mortgages, to pay off the bank loans. More were sold to keep the family in food and clothes. By the time Chaco emigrated to Canada, the family's only income came from the rubber estate that adjoined the Ayemenem house and the few coconut trees in the compound. This is what baby Cochima and Cochumaria lived off after everybody else had died, left, or been returned. To be fair to Comrade Pilla, he did not plan the course of events that followed. He merely slipped his ready fingers into history's waiting glove. Veluta's last visit to Comrade Pilla, after his confrontation with Mamachi and baby Kochima, and what had passed between them remained a secret. The last betrayal that sent Veluta across the river, swimming against the current in the dark and rain, well in time for his blind date with history. Veluta caught the last bus back from Kotayam, where he was having the canning machine mended. He ran into one of the other factory workers at the bus stop, who told him with a smirk that Mamachi wanted to see him. He went straight to the Yemenem house, though, on the one hand, he was taken by surprise, on the other he knew, had known, with an ancient instinct, that one day history's twisted chickens would come home to roost. Through the whole of Mamachi's outburst, he remained restrained and strangely composed. It was a composure born of extreme provocation. It stemmed from a lucidity that lies beyond rage. When Veluta arrived, Mamachi lost her bearings and spewed her blind venom, her crass, insufferable insults, at a panel in the sliding folding door until baby Kochima tactfully swiveled her around and aimed her rage in the right direction, at Veluta standing very still in the gloom. Mamachi continued her tirade, her eyes empty, her face twisted and ugly, her anger propelling her towards Veluta until she was shouting right into his face and he could feel the spray of her spit and smell the stale tea on her breath. Out! she had screamed eventually. If I find you on my property tomorrow, I'll have you castrated like the pariah dog that you are. I'll have you killed. We'll see about that, Veluta said quietly. That was all he said. And that was what baby Kochima in Inspector Thomas Matthews' office enhanced and embroidered into threats of murder and abduction. Mamachi spat in Veluta's face, thick spit. It spattered across his skin, his mouth and eyes. He just stood there, stunned. Then he turned and left. As he walked away from the house, he felt his senses had been honed and heightened. His mind, desperately craving some kind of mooring, clung to details. It labeled each thing it encountered. Gate, he thought as he walked out of the gate. Gate. Road. Stones. Sky. Rain. The rain on his skin was warm. He knew where he was going. It's happening, a voice informed him. It has begun. His mind, suddenly impossibly old, floated out of his body and hovered high above him in the air, from where it jabbered useless warnings. It looked down and watched a young man's body walk through the darkness in the driving rain. More than anything else, that body wanted to sleep, sleep and wake up in another world, with the smell of her skin in the air that he breathed, her body on his. He might never see her again. Where was she? What had they done to her? Had they hurt her? He knew what he had to do. He had to get to Comrade Pilla. He no longer knew why. His feet took him to Lucky Press, which was locked, and then across the tiny yard to Comrade Pilla's house. Comrade Pilla had finished his avial and was squashing a ripe banana, extruding the sludge through his closed fist into his plate of curd when Veluta knocked. He sent his wife to open the door. Who is it? That Papan Paravan son. He says it's urgent. Comrade Pilla finished his curd unhurriedly. He wiped his hands, belched his appreciation, and went to the door. Enda? At this time of the night? As he replied, Veluta heard his own voice beat back at him as though it had hit a wall. The man he was talking to was small and far away, behind a wall of glass. 
This is a little village, Comrade Pillar was saying. People talk. I listen to what they say. It's not as though I don't know what's been going on. Once again, Veluta heard himself say something which made no difference to the man he spoke to. His own voice coiled around him like a snake. Maybe, Comrade Pilla said, but Comrade, you should know that party was not constituted to support workers' indiscipline in their private life. And there it was again. Another religion turned against itself. Another edifice constructed by the human mind, decimated by human nature. Comrade Pilla shut the door and returned to his wife and dinner. He decided to eat another banana. Standing outside in the rain, in the cold, wet light from the single street light, Veluta was suddenly overcome by sleep. He had to force his eyelids to stay open. Tomorrow, he told himself, tomorrow when the rain stops. His feet walked him to the river, as though they were the leash and he was the dog. History walking the dog. In a while, the rain slowed to a drizzle and then stopped. The breeze shook water from the trees, and for a while it rained only under trees, where shelter had once been. A weak, watery moon filtered through the clouds and revealed a young man sitting on the topmost of thirteen stone steps that led into the water. He was very still, very wet, very young. In a while, he stood up, took off the white mundu he was wearing, squeezed the water from it, and twisted it round his head like a turban. Naked now, he walked down the thirteen stone steps into the water and further until the river was chest high. Then he began to swim with easy, powerful strokes, striking out towards where the current was swift and certain, where the really deep began. It took him only a few minutes to make the crossing. He stepped onto the path that led through the swamp to the history house. He left no ripples in the water, no footprints on the shore. He held his mundu spread above his head to dry. The wind lifted it like a sail. He was suddenly happy. Things will get worse, he thought to himself, then better. He was walking swiftly now towards the heart of darkness, as lonely as a wolf. The god of loss, the god of small things. Naked, but for his nail varnish. Three children on the river bank, a pair of twins and another, whose mauve corduroy pinafore said, Holiday, in a tilting, happy font. Esther and Rahel dragged the boat out of the bushes where they usually hid it. They set it down in the water and held it steady for Sophie Mall to climb in. They seemed to trust the darkness and moved up and down the glistening stone steps as sure-footed as young goats. Sophie Mall was more tentative. She had a cloth bag with food purloined from the fridge slung across her chest. Bread, cake, biscuits. The twins, weighed down by their mother's words, If it weren't for you, I would be free. I should have dumped you in an orphanage the day you were born. You're the millstones round my neck. Carried nothing. Thanks to what the orange drink, lemon drink man did to Esther, their home away from home was already equipped. In the two weeks since Esther rode scarlet jam and thought two thoughts, they had squirreled away essential provisions, matches, potatoes, a battered saucepan, an inflatable goose, socks with multicolored toes, ballpoint pens with London buses, and the Qantas koala with loosened buttoned eyes. What if Mamu finds us and begs us to come back? Then we will, but only if she begs. Esther the Compassionate Sophie Mall had convinced the twins that it was essential that she go along too. Her clinching argument was that if she were left behind, she might be tortured and forced to reveal their hiding place. Esther waited until Rahel got in, then took his place, sitting astride the little boat as though it were a seesaw. He used his legs to push the boat away from the shore. As they lurched into the deeper water, they began to row diagonally upstream, against the current, the way Valuta had taught them to. 
If you want to end up there, you must aim there. In the dark, they couldn't see that they were in the wrong lane on a silent highway full of muffled traffic, that branches, logs, parts of trees were motoring towards them at some speed. They were past the really deep, only yards from the other side, when they collided with a floating log and the little boat tipped over. It happened to them often enough on previous expeditions across the river, and they would swim after the boat, and using it as a float, dog paddle to the shore. This time, they couldn't see their boat in the dark. It was swept away in the current. They headed for the shore, surprised at how much effort it took them to cover that short distance. Esta managed to grab a low branch that arched down into the water. He peered down river through the darkness to see if he could see the boat at all. I can't see anything. It's gone. Rahel, covered in slush, clambered ashore and held a hand out to help Esther pull himself out of the water. And all our food is spoiled, Rahel said to Sophie Mall, and was met with silence. A rushing, rolling, fish-swimming silence. Sophie Mall, she whispered to the rushing river, we're here, here, near the Alimba tree. Nothing. On Rahel's heart, Papa Chisma snapped open its somber wings, out, in, and lifted its legs, up, down. They ran along the bank, calling out to her, but she was gone, carried away on the muffled highway, gray-green, with fish in it, and at night, the broken yellow moon in it. There was no storm music, no whirlpool spun up from the inky depths of the Minichal. No shark supervised the tragedy. Just a quiet handing over ceremony, a boat spilling its cargo, a river accepting the offering, one small life, a brief sunbeam with a silver thimble clenched for luck in its little fist. It was four in the morning, still dark, when the twins, exhausted, distraught, and covered in mud, made their way through the swamp and approached the history house. They lay down in the back veranda on a grass mat with an inflatable goose and a Qantas koala bear. A pair of damp dwarfs, numb with fear, waiting for the world to end. Do you think she's dead by now? Esther didn't answer. What's going to happen? We'll go to jail. He jolly, well knew, little man. He lived in a caravan, dum-dum. They didn't see someone else lying asleep in the shadows, as lonely as a wolf, a brown leaf on his black back that made the monsoons come on time. In his clean room in the dirty Ayemenem house, Esther, not old, not young, sat on his bed in the dark. He sat very straight, shoulders squared, hands in his lap, as though he was next in line for some sort of inspection or waiting to be arrested. It was raining steadily, night rain, that lonely drummer practicing his role long after the rest of the band has gone to bed. Baby Kochima picked up her maroon diary, which came with its own pen. She turned to 19 June and made a fresh entry. Her manner was routine. She wrote, I love you, I love you. Every page in the diary had an identical entry. She had a case full of diaries with identical entries. Some said more than just that. Some had the day's accounts, to-do lists, snatches of favorite dialogue from favorite soaps, but even these entries all began with the same words. I love you, I love you. Father Mulligan had died four years ago of viral hepatitis in an ashram north of Rishikesh. His years of contemplation of Hindu scriptures had led initially to theological curiosity, but eventually to a change of faith. Fifteen years ago, Father Mulligan became a Vaishnavite, a devotee of Lord Vishnu. He wrote to her every Diwali and sent her a greeting card every New Year. She was offended by the fact that he had actually, eventually, renounced his vows, but not for her, for other vows. It was like welcoming someone with open arms 
only to have him walk straight past into someone else's. Father Mulligan's death did not alter the text of the entries in Baby Kochima's diary, simply because, as far as she was concerned, it did not alter his availability. If anything, she possessed him in death in a way that she never had while he was alive. At least her memory of him was hers, wholly hers. Baby Kochima settled back on her pillow and waited to hear Rahel come out of Esther's room. They had begun to make her uneasy, both of them. A few mornings ago, she had opened her window for a breath of fresh air and caught them red-handed in the act of returning from somewhere. Clearly, they had spent the whole night out, together. Where could they have been? What and how much did they remember? When would they leave? What were they doing sitting together in the dark for so long? She fell asleep propped up against her pillows, thinking that perhaps, over the sound of the rain and the television, she hadn't heard Esther's door open, that Rahel had gone to bed long ago. She hadn't. Rahel was lying on Esther's bed. She looked thinner lying down, younger, smaller. Her face was turned towards the window beside the bed. Slanting rain hit the bars of the window grill and shattered into a fine spray over her face and her smooth bare arm. Her soft sleeveless t-shirt was a glowing yellow in the dark. The bottom half of her, in blue jeans, melted into the darkness. It was a little cold, a little wet, a little quiet, the air. But what was there to say? From where he sat at the end of the bed, Esther, without turning his head, could see her, faintly outlined, the sharp line of her jaw, her collarbones like wings that spread from the base of her throat to the ends of her shoulders, a bird held down by skin. She turned her head and looked at him. He sat very straight, waiting for the inspection. He had finished the ironing. She was lovely to him, her hair, her cheeks, her small, clever-looking hands, his sister. He sat even straighter. Still, he could see her, grown into their mother's skin, the liquid glint of her eyes in the dark, her small, straight nose, her mouth, full-lipped, something wounded looking about it, as though it was flinching from something as though long ago someone, a man with rings, had hit her across it. A beautiful, hurt mouth. Their beautiful mother's mouth, Esther thought, Amu's mouth, that had kissed his hand through the barred train window, first class on the Madras mail to Madras. Bye, Esther. God bless, Amu's mouth had said, Amu's trying not to cry mouth. The last time he had seen her, she was standing on the platform of the Cochin Harbor Terminus, her face turned up to the train window. Rahel held by Amu's hand, a mosquito on a leash, a refugee stick insect in bata sandals, an airport ferry at a railway station, gray in the station light, hollow people, homeless, hungry, still touched by last year's famine, their revolution postponed for the time being by comrade E.M.S. Nambudripad, Soviet stooge, running dog, the former apple of Peking's eye. But this time, for Amu and her two egg twins, there was no Plymouth window to watch it through, no net to save them as they vaulted through the circus air. Pack your things and leave, Chaco had said, stepping over a broken door, a handle in his hand. And Amu, though her hands were trembling, hadn't looked up from her unnecessary hemming. A tin of ribbons lay open on her lap. But Rahel had looked up and seen that Chaco had disappeared and left a monster in his place. 